So, Kosovis, thank you so much for being here in Harvard. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm looking forward to our class. Um, before that, I just wanted to give a, a few questions so that we can have it as a background for later for students who want to go back to it. And so the, the first question is, tell me about what was happening in Peru when you got in, the first time you went and you knew that you had to do this rural roads program. So this was uh, mid-90s, uh, around 94. Uh, Peru had uh, gone through a very tough process with the shining path. Uh, so uh, you could find us in many areas there was no economic activity at all, particularly in the highlands of Peru. Uh, security had uh, destroyed the trust in institutions. So then the uh, Fujimori administration started a program to reverse this situation, first combating real activity and then focusing on uh, creating economic infrastructure, so restoring the economic infrastructure on the coastal areas and some cities. They started looking at the problem in the highlands and they realized that say, well, not only that poverty was rampant, but uh, uh, that the various instruments they have created, for example, uh, a social fund, you may remember from callers, mm -hmm. um, that was financing a myriad of little investments here and there. Uh, mm -hmm school classes uh, here, uh, water system there, were not producing the intended results. I think something was lacking. And uh, that thing they realized was uh, uh, rural accessibility, so making sure that, say, people will be able to have access to services, to markets uh, uh, that have been destroyed after so many years of uh, neglect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting because also in addition to this situation with the uh, shining path, there were many other factors behind this, uh, starting with uh, the fact that it's a region that has a very adverse geography, so access has always been, historically, been a problem. But also uh, some government policies that fail badly, right? Like uh, decentralization, for example, uh, that have weakened completely the institutions, and uh, they need to do something about it mm -hmm. to avert that. Mm -hmm. So you were asked to prepare a rural roads project from the beginning, or this evolved into a rural roads project? They had asked us. Uh, we had a, another engagement in the transport sector that was focused more, more on the economic infrastructure, uh, highways in the, in the coastal areas. And this was the attempt to now do something that could work in the highlands of them. Uh -huh. And who was the counterpart ministry that asked you? The Minister of Transport. Minister of Transport. And uh, that was part of the problem, because uh, there was no capacity at all at the municipal, at the district level, at the provincial level, but according to legislation, they were responsible for doing that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's this tension? How you design something that will not create these capacities in central government mm -hmm. and then perpetuate something that so you know that in the long run, and this is important when you think about mm -hmm. scalability, for example, mm -hmm. in the long run has to be passed to lower levels of government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Finding an institutional setup that will work by say, stepping in until you have capacity, but having from day one the idea of uh, transferring those responsibilities to the lower levels of government mm -hmm. and developing that capacity mm -hmm. was, uh, say, from the very beginning, one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. And this vision to improve access of rural roads, was that a vision from the other way from the president, or was this a Ministry of Transport? Uh, I started with the president. That uh -huh. president, if you recall, was uh, very keen on... Uh, Engineer. He was a, a teacher. Ah, he was a teacher. Yeah, okay. but, uh, but I was very... Uh, so he had a very strong personality, uh -huh. and uh, things uh, that they had to work. Uh -huh. uh, so he brought immediately, he said to the Minister of Transport, can you have now to do something about the highlands of the road, Very good. So then you started thinking about what model would work. Uh, so did you try different things? How did you come out with the with the model that eventually worked? Yeah. Well, looking back, I think uh, what uh, was one of the biggest challenges we faced became the opportunity. Uh -huh. The fact that uh, after so many years of shining path, there was no information about say, the networks, the traffics, nothing. Uh, we realized that uh, the traditional approaches will not work. Uh -huh. 
So how you know which of the myriad of roles they have, which ones are the most important ones? Uh, they are not, so the, the current situation is not reflecting, say, the economic activity, but rather, say, whether they were touched or not by guerrilla. Mm -hmm. So uh, it became evident that we needed to involve uh, stakeholders, the beneficiaries, mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And the Ministry of Transport was open to that? I have to recognize, uh, I, I really like working in Peru, I had worked uh -huh. before in Peru. Yeah. They were fantastic, uh, uh -huh. because they trust us. And, uh -huh. uh, this was completely new for mm -hmm. them, yes. but they were open and uh, they tried. And, and even, uh, uh, as an anecdote, uh, the, one of the pillars of the design was doing maintenance immediately after rehabilitation through migrant enterprises. And when we approved the project, the bank approved the project, was a changeover of government of a minister. Mm -hmm. And the new minister says, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. But they didn't stop us. Mm -hmm. They allow us six months to try it. Mm -hmm. And after six months, they were so convinced that we had a lot of support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, there was a, a willingness to test. I would say that probably all the past experiences, even experiences that were not delivering as much, for example, for COD as a social fund, mm -hmm. made them think a little bit out of uh, so how did you start the process of co-creating this this design with the community? Uh, during the preparation, we started traveling with our counterparts. They had set up a, a small unit in the Ministry of Transport. We wanted to keep it small because the long run was to transfer yes. responsibilities. Uh, interestingly, they hired not only engineers but there was a social scientist, uh -huh. and uh, we started traveling and organizing informal consultations to start here and see what were the issues at stake. And from those consultations, uh, it became clear first that if you want, uh, the needs are so enormous that you need to find low-cost solutions, right? If you want to put in place a low-cost solution, the first question is, is it's going to last? And the, the communities were saying, don't do what we have seen before, that say all of a sudden, send me some money, so a project, you do something and then you disappear. We want these conditions once improved to stay. So that was a strong connection with, uh, with maintenance, which was an important policy for this project, for the sustainability. And then the other one, and this is where I started discovering uh, how uh, participation brings accountability. As we were visited in different places, they started realizing we can't go back to that community until we do something. And little by little, that forced them, well, what is the plan? And how, how are we going to deliver for that community so we can plan now, say, uh, with our, our plan and, and we know, say, that we are continuously engaging with them as opposed to just an ad hoc visit that they create even more tension, you yeah. raise expectations. And this was at the federal level, the ministry? This is a central level. Yeah. And the local government was involved as well? Um, that was the, the other challenge. We wanted them to be involved. Initially, they had no, no say because the money was coming from the central government. But uh, as part of the setup, the institutional setup, we put that requirement. We will not intervene in any district if it has not been validated by the mayor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that imply creating a, some sort of agreement that this is what we're going to do mm -hmm. in, in your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And then inviting the mayor to participate in different activities. And there were two kinds. The ones that say really were involved, and others that say are more like that look well, but started seeing the world, something is happening, and then little mm -hmm. by little, mm -hmm. then we, we brought them into the project. And in these places that were so far away, did you find that there was like a uniform, Strength of community organization? Uh, there is a lot. Eh? Uh -huh. and, uh, the highlands of Peru are traditionally, particularly in the southern part, have some community structures that are very powerful. Uh -huh. In other parts, they're not. Uh -huh. And if you go to other parts of Peru, uh, what they call the Selva, not at all. Uh -huh. So we wanted to build on those structures. Uh -huh. uh, it was very interesting. At that time, there was a debate about say, but are you going to pay for the services? Uh -huh. uh, may go against a culture where they devote, I think it was one to or so the Minka. A, the Minka, a yeah. day for the community. Yeah. So that was a, a very uh, debated topic. And uh -huh. uh, we convinced the, 
the government that imposing the burden of maintaining the roads on a continuous basis was probably going too far for the makers, and rather that we could complement. So they could do that for certain purposes, but for an activity like a road maintenance that is so intensive and so on, it was better to organize a different instrument. So, so you use the same organization, whether a community was strong already or whether there was no organization no, of the community? The, for maintenance, we created my enterprises. For everybody. They were common for them. And all, all follow more or less the same model. That's interesting also how they were developed. But we use uh, this uh, community structures for all the components, like for example the non-motorized trucks, and uh, those you could see that the places where they were used to that, they flourished, they did a fantastic, uh, fantastic job. So the ones that had organization did better in the short term, at least? Yeah, when, yeah. when, when they were applying this, for example, to the non-motorized component that it was uh, improving trucks for, for animals and for people, not, not non-motorized, Really, they were fantastic in being able to organize themselves, to, to determine what were the needs, uh, how see, these networks uh, may make like, say, walking say, for three days to get to farther markets and see where to put some places to rest and to keep, for example, the animals. Very, very interesting. So, there were a lot of surprises in terms of what people Maybe. needed that you had to Actually, thought. it was a constant learning. Yes. Uh -huh. So what I think uh, was relevant is to have this vision for the long, the yes. long run. Uh, there are two particular aspects. I say when you design a program of this size, uh, essential. One is uh, this is the long-term sustainability, and then the other is whatever you have tested at a pilot level, where it will work when you extend it. And uh, that's very interesting because for sustainability, you know particular case that say every road that has been rehabilitated has to be maintained yeah. permanently, right? Yeah. And you don't you don't allow them to go ahead to other places without maintaining. So that's sustainability. The scaling up aspect comes from well if I if we succeed and we do a very large program, the amount of money going to the maintenance will be enormous for the central mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. So you need to start creating other sources of finance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it forces you to think mm -hmm. from day one. So mm -hmm. um, it's very helpful. I, I, I tend to do some engineers when I get to that. Is you look at say, the final product and you see what are the features of that final, and then you come back. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You start asking yourself the questions so from the very beginning. Say how this is going to work when you scale it up. Mm -hmm. So the community helped you find and design what were the roads and small access roads that needed to be part of the program. And it also was formed in microenterprises through right. the maintenance. So the microenterprises was seen as a, as a program that will allow to meet some of the objectives of the project, generate employment and, and promote more local development. So along a road, you have communities. So from the communities, forming a microenterprise with, let's say, 10, 15 people, and we maintain a, a stretch. This was different from traditional programs, uh, typical uh, public work program where, uh, say, an agency will hire different people uh, and pay a salary, right, so for some work, two kilometers, one kilometer. These were micro enterprises. They were trained, they had a legal status, mm -hmm. they, they were accountable, they entered into a contract, they had to produce some results. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you had 10 people working together and joining forces, mm -hmm. the amount of money that they could save together was much bigger. And mm -hmm. they, this allowed them to think more than reinvesting, say, how to reinvest their own money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was uh, something that say, gave the character to, to this project. How to reinvest the money of the microenterprise or the Ministry of Transport? Or the ah. They had a contract with the Ministry of Transport. Yeah, for a certain amount. For a, for a certain amount. They were saving some money, uh, and then they were reinvesting, reinvesting and creating other opportunities. So for example, they would buy uh, a vehicle that would allow them to move right, more efficiently, but then they will use the vehicle to provide services to the community. Okay. And then uh, as they were progressing and doing so well, they needed to maintain some balance with the rest of the community. So they need to create opportunities for the others. Otherwise, they would say, hey, you are doing so well. What about us? Right? Yeah. Uh, and what was uh, an interesting thing when we developed this, uh, the NGOs we work with, that they were all very poor. Uh, 
by informing a micro enterprise, they will have a profile, a mix of skills, where one of the questions that they asked was, uh, what will you do with 5,000 soils? Would it be like $2,000? Some people could not answer. So they wanted to have a combination of people in which two or three, at least, could have an idea of the future. They were all very poor when we started. But this mix, this composition, together with the ability to receive training, to receive an entrepreneur training, how you keep books, mm -hmm, uh, made a big difference. And uh, was completely different from all the experiences that we had in other places. Uh, so it's very common in, in public works program where so the best thing that can happen to a person is to remain being hired every year to have X number of months being paid. This was completely different. Mm -hmm. So with time, they started rotating, saying, well, now I don't need, I, I have all the skills, I can do something else. So others will join the micro mm -hmm. And now, so because the program continued in various phases, mm -hmm. then later on, there was no need to, to create the was critical mass of micro enterprises that started competing to do contractor work, small contracts, in other places as well. They had a board. Uh, and and the, the micro enterprises were trained by NGOs? Who was training them? We, we had a, a combination of um, some, uh, some NGOs that formed in the, uh, the setup in uh -huh. the beginning, mm -hmm. and then some uh, Accompaniments and with uh, so we call them, they were called monitors that will spend time with them, say, for one year. Uh -huh. uh, so a monitor will supervise or, or accompany a certain number of micro enterprises in the same. So their startup phase, in a way? So after, after the startup phase. Uh -huh. The startup phase was with, let's say, NGOs, specialized NGOs, with a unit that had formed a, a very good team mm -hmm. uh, in the government, mm -hmm. in the government unit, mm -hmm. to, to develop that. Mm -hmm. It was one of the, the skills that it was uh, further developed within the, the agency. Mm -hmm. that ability. So and they actually, being in the Ministry of Transport, uh, it was uh, amazing to see how it was engineering and social at the same level. Yeah, uh, because that was the, the program they were focusing on these social outcomes. And, uh, they, they empowered the social team to do. Yeah. And when you started to implement the first pilots, were there things that you had to shift? That had to be changed from what you yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, to start with, uh, we didn't know how much things will cost because mm -hmm. of this uh, history of no activity. Mm -hmm. So there was a, for one year before the loan was approved, there was a pilot that they went to reverse the government uh, when we approved the loan to, to test is this going to work. And the first question was uh, can local contractors, small contractors in, in these different regions, do the work? and at what cost. So that was the first test. We had to adjust in terms of reference. Initially, we were thinking of uh, even lower cost of options, uh, like uh, in some spot improvement, but then we realized that we're not producing the intended results. So we, we corrected that in the first year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, other, the other aspect was, we wanted to first focus on six departments. These were the, the departments uh, with the highest but immediately the political pressure was, we need to expand the program. So uh, instead of uh, having six uh, for three years, we had six for just one year, and then mm -hmm. we expanded. But, but we had enough to see that this was working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after a year, the, the loan was approved? The first then, loan was approved? Yeah, it was during the project preparation that we did a pilot. Uh -huh. And the reason was, well, we know so little about this area, we want to test it. Yeah, and how long was project preparation? It was uh, like one year. One year. And then so the first loan to the board went. Was there anything that you needed to change in terms of procurement practices? Yes, some, for example, allow us uh, to allow us to do some direct procurement of a community-based organization. Which has never been done before. Right. Yeah. And that was, uh, that required some sort of uh, waivers. Waivers, an exception from our side, uh -huh. but also from their side. Uh -huh. It was interesting, and the fact that it was part of a, an IDV World Bank project allowed them to do that. Uh -huh. But with time, we, we needed, say, uh, after three phases, mm -hmm. uh, we have now macro enterprises competing, they compete uh, openly. Mm -hmm. It's nothing special. Mm -hmm. You don't need that anymore. You don't need that anymore. Okay. 
So you have the IDB, you have the Ministry of Transport, and you have the World Bank. Was that complicated to pilot through a year when you had three bureaucracies together? Uh, actually, it was a thing. It was a challenge and a strength. Uh -huh. First, uh, when we started, the idea was, well, should we split? Uh, highlands of Peru go, go from north to south. It's a very extended zone. So um, we split the two regions in two regions, uh, with the bank taking one. And then we realized this is going to create a problem to our counterparts that we have to deal with perhaps two systems. Of so we decided very early on to go together. And this was the first time that we did uh, joint financing which means that even one contract we, we were not assigning to a particular institution, we were sharing 50-50 the cost. So you were, you were sharing procurement practices and all that? the same procurement practices. Amazing. We, yeah, so it was a, among the first to do that. Yeah. The advantage that this allowed us to bring, say, two teams, IDB and, and the World Bank, and assign different responsibilities. So, uh -huh. for example, we. So the bank side took more on the social side uh -huh. because we had invested in particular aspects, right? And, and uh, we didn't need to replicate the same skill. We were one team traveling together, same missions. And for the counterpart, it was very useful to see how the three of us, because the conversation became much more balanced. Mm -hmm. We were three to a conversation as opposed mm -hmm. to one that brings the, all the money. And the right? conditions. And the conditions. Yeah. So that also, I think, uh, helped create a, a, a spirit of a partnership yeah. that uh, was amazing because we needed them say, uh, to, to trust in what we were doing when we took some interesting challenges that initially they thought could be too much. Yeah. Gender so being one. Mm -hmm. Gender, yeah. yeah. So you had one, what was the challenge with gender? Well, uh, initially, say, there was some participation to prices very little. We wanted to put some quotas to increase it. They say we believe this is going too far. So it was a, a process of exposing uh, a very good counterpart to the realities until they were convinced. Yeah. And we, they were convinced when we moved from phase one to phase two. And this is why you, you may remember you had yeah. to uh, approve the second phase yeah. that the gender became part of the objective of the project. So we had the objective of providing access to services and so on with gender equity. And that was uh, like uh, the result of uh, more than two years of, of working together using an impact assessment, doing some analytical work. So, so uh, before, on, so on the uh, pre project preparation, there were six communities you were working with? Six uh, departments. Six department, uh, departments, departments. Yeah, including the maybe. jungle or no? No, no. 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 Only the, the highlands. High 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 and so then you went into the loan, and how much was the loan for? So the first one was the 90 million in each bank, and each then bank. Uh, 60, so it was a... 200 something million. 250 total. 250 million. And how many years? It was like five years. For five six. years. And how, were you supposed to go national with this loan? The first not? one was going to, so it was uh, this uh, 12 departments. Yeah. Uh, the second one remained uh, 12 departments. I think the third one was 20 and uh, most of them, yes. And the other loans were similar amounts? No. Mm -hmm. 250? Then the next one was uh, 45 and 45. And, uh -huh. and, and then the, the other one was like 60. So it decreased? Decreased and increased. It the, was, the first uh, one was the biggest? The biggest. Yeah. And the reason was the fiscal situation in Peru. Ah, mm -hmm. of course. Right. Yeah. They had just had the Puji Puji shock. Uh, they had, uh, when we moved to the second phase, they were going through uh, some uh, recession and some fiscal yeah. yeah. So they needed to reduce the uh, investment, the level of investment uh -huh. across many programs. Uh -huh. So, but they kept this one. Mm -hmm. Because? I believe uh, that uh, they, they, they were seeing say, the, the outcome of this program, uh, the social impact that the program was having. Uh, they didn't want to stop. So were you doing impact evaluations already in the second? We did uh, three or four impact say every three years. Yeah. Uh, essential, essential mm -hmm. for two reasons. So you are monitoring, uh, obviously, you know, six months, uh, you produce your report, or every four, uh, three months you produce the reports. But is it working? Mm -hmm. uh, you, 
you have to measure not only say what is the output in terms of uh, yes, we rehabilitated yeah, X number of kilometers, but say what is happening with that. Right? Yeah. And when you look at say, uh, the outcomes, you have a variety of outcomes with a very different kind of uh, cycle. Right? So you will have an uh, immediate impact on traveling conditions. So we know that say every time we would complete the rehabilitation, travel time will be cut by half. And that will stimulate a lot of uh, say, increasing traffic and services that say before were not possible because it was not reliable. They they would, would take uh, say eight hours to reach a place. Now they were doing this in four hours, so we would plan mm -hmm. some services. Mm -hmm. But what about access to education, access to health, mm -hmm. uh, economic activity, income generation activities, and so on? They take time, and uh, in, communities have to first meet the, the basic needs. They have to also to connect with the, the possibilities that the interventions make, and this mm -hmm. takes more time. So it's a, you know, a critical aspect of this uh, impact assessment is to start testing. Mm -hmm. this is, are we getting the intended results, knowing that some will take it home? Mm -hmm. So by doing this regularly, it helps you making decisions about the program. I can say that say, after each of these impact assessments, we added and we reworked certain aspects of the program. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also to link it with um, say policies, important policies that have to be agreed before mm -hmm. moving uh, to the next phase. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Did you have to deal with political pressures apart from moving faster later? Because you know, Kimori was a very he was he micromanaged. So did he uh, interfere in any way? No. Uh, the main problem was speed. Was speed. He was just wanted, wanted faster. Speed. Yes. Uh -huh. But then the problem was that. Without very, without any interference, uh, uh -huh. and I think it had to do with the this uh, social dimensions of the, of the program, yeah. and uh, the fact that also we started seeing some uh, say civic engagement change. You know, that was also something measured. Uh, you do impact assessments, and you detect there are dimensions I want to learn more about. Mm -hmm. So you commission a study that will focus on that particular aspect and you use uh, uh, information you have around the project or you run a survey. So we did, uh, for example, some, some analysis on the political impact. Uh, very interesting, so this uh, micro enterprises mm -hmm. produce leaders, mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. leaders. And uh, for example, uh, after the first phase, uh, there were like 82 that became mayors. Right? Wow. From the migrant enterprises. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of the exposure. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, then, uh, even uh, in the elections, you could see more activity. One of the studies measured that. Mm -hmm. the districts where we had a program, compared to the rest of the department where there was no program. And um, because they have been involved uh, through this participatory approach in asking questions, in, uh, in expressing their views, they were more demanding. Also. <laughs> and uh, for example, uh, there were stories uh, a mayor that didn't pay any attention to the network of uh, non motorized trucks that they have. Mm -hmm. Well, they were not re elected, right? Uh -huh. Things like that. <laughs> so accountability was. Accountability. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And then um, I remember, and we, we should give you time so that we can go for lunch. And then I remember this got the Excellence Award in the bank. The presidential award. Uh, award was it replicated in other parts of the world? Uh, now I would say many of our rural road programs include things like this. Uh -huh. uh, probably not into a full extent, but uh -huh. uh, uh, trying to use uh, some sort of community-based maintenance and things like that. Have and do you, with that experience, do you think you need a leader like uh, Fujimori that was sort of opening the way and saying experiment or just go quickly? Or can this also create accountability when you don't have such a committed top leader behind this? Well, I, I say clearly you need leadership to put the poor people in the driver's seat, right? you will have to give them a chance. Yeah. If not, so if you follow always the criteria, economic criteria and so on, well, you're not going to get to it. So this is where the leadership matters the most. Mm -hmm. After that, if you are able to start testing some of this, it's so powerful that I think you 
mobilize support immediately. And uh, I think uh, the, an example of that is that when really they were suffering with these fiscal constraints and they had to move to the second phase, the reason they decided to go ahead was precisely because they were seeing the program was delivering this result, they didn't want to, to stop that. 